are y'all doing? Our last class. I feel the same way. I feel the same way. I really, I really, really, really do. Uh, I'm sorry? DVD. Yeah. <laughs> so you can watch at home? Yeah. <laughs> you have some what that you'd like to read? The moment. What would you what moment would you like to relive? Let's do a little walk down. <laughs> what moment would you like to relive? The mouthpiece is strong, dropping the nuts. So far, so far they all revolve around. Nothing else, just dropping the nuts in the strong mouth. Chat roulette, when I first tried to do what? what? Oh yes, yes. How'd that go for everyone? Not well. <laughs> but now, now if I explained it, everyone would just go, ah yes, why are you explaining this stuff that is so obvious? Why would you even bother insulting our intelligence with something so obvious? A little walk down memory lane trying to think some of my favorite, well, I can tell you definitively what my favorite, favorite moments were. Every moment, every single moment, no, 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 that would be a lie. No, there were certainly some moments I'd like to forget. As much as I like to make light of having to toss people out of classes, it's not my favorite thing. Uh, did I throw something in this class at somebody? I do it in so many classes, it's hard to remember. And I, I worried about that after the fact. I came perilously close to putting somebody's eye out, but my aim was good. Um, and no one was harmed. Um, but I wouldn't have wanted an innocent bystander, for instance, to have been harmed. That would have been bad. No, my favorite moments were any time we sort of had an actual authentic conversation. Those moments when I'm not some douchebag up in a, you know, whatever, um, and you guys aren't young students, and we're actually talking to people like human beings do, right? That's what we like. That's when we learn. You guys will remember very little about the stuff that were on the slides, but there will be little phrases and little things that will stick in your mind, and hopefully they will serve you well as you move on. It appears, I may see some of you, but I, it, appears, it appears that I will be teaching a business law class. Is that something you guys take next year? Legal environments? But that, you, take, you take music legal environments or business legal environments, or both? Well, if you take business, take mine. We could, we could all be together again, be reunited. Legal environments and business. And then, of course, as your juniors and seniors, you'll get me for ethics and all that stuff, and uh, that'll be fun. Um, let's see here. So we got a test on Wednesday, correct? How are you guys feeling about that? That good, huh? It'll be okay. It will be okay. Let's see, we left off last time. Is it kind of, I got the damn slides posted, everybody saw that, right? Yeah. Like that. Where did we leave off on this, on accounting? Anybody have their notes? What now? Oh, I was trying to explain owner's equity, yes. Yes, yeah, the delightful owner's equity. And Alex, Alex gave me little support on this. Yeah, badly, apparently, <laughs> right? So, oh, that won't help. So we remember this, assets minus liability. The difference between equity and a loan, loans have to be paid back, loans are liabilities. Every month you gotta service that damn debt. An asset, I'm sorry, equity, the probably the best way I can get you to get it is if you think of equity as being sort of synonymous with ownership. So 
mom and dad decide they want to fund your music career. Uh, or not. <laughs> and they say, well, look, we, we want to invest. We want to, we want to give you some money. But in exchange, we own a little piece of it. Right? So this often happens where you go and you try and make a record, and you've got zero income, right? Because you haven't made the record yet. But you've got a studio bill for, say, five grand. Now you have been saving your quarters and pennies and everything else, and you saved up $2,500. You put that $2,500 towards that studio bill, but you're still left with $2,500 due. Mom and dad say, we'll pay. They give you that money, and assuming, just for easy kind of understanding, that the only money that comes in is your $2,500 and mom and dad's $2,500. Who are the owners of your entity, your musical entity? You and mom and dad. And in fact, on the surface, you split it right down the middle. They own 50%, you own 50%. Now, supposing through some fluke of nature, you take that CD and spending no marketing dollars whatsoever, it just becomes a hit. And I, don't, I so have such distaste for major labels, I'm not, I won't even mention one. Let's see if I can come up with something else, something more agreeable. I'm having trouble coming up with anything agreeable. What, what movies do we like today? <coughs> Pardon? Give me a specific example. Kick-Ass. Supposing the maker of Kick-Ass hears your song, he or she, who made Kick-Ass? Let's say she. And she says, I must have that song, right, that you recorded. And I will pay you $100,000 for that song. Now I, maker of Kick-Ass, get to own that copyright, right? Now we can discuss whether or not you should sell your copyright outright or whatever. But if somebody gives you a life-altering sum of money, sell whatever it is they want, okay? As a rule. 100 grand for you guys, probably a life-altering amount of money, particularly if it's not, you, we need to talk, uh, particularly if it's, you know, just for one song. So now 100 grand has come in. What happens to it? Because you have no expenses, and now you have $100,000 on your balance sheet, so your balance sheet is tipped the way we all want it to tip, very heavy on the asset side. What happens to that 100000 bucks, given the way we created this little entity? Split. Mom and dad get fifty grand, and you keep fifty grand because they're owners. You see what I'm saying? Does that help at all? It's the best I can do, whether it helps or not. All right. Um, balance sheet, got to know this one. <coughs> balance sheet, you look at, and it, it shows you right at any given moment, assuming that the balance sheet was created some, at some point recently, what you got, right? It shows you those assets, the liabilities, and the owner's equity. So you can look very quickly and say, yeah, this is a healthy company. You would say that if what? Why would you judge a company to be healthy? Just common sense. It's always going to balance. Yeah, it's got more assets than liability. If it has more assets than liability, what balance is it? The equity. It means that on that side, the equity, so you've got $100,000 in assets, $50,000 in equity, you're unbalanced. Again, you're top heavy towards the asset side. You've got to balance it with 50 grand in equity. That's, a, that's fine. That's a good company. It means you got some cash in the bank, right? Bad company would have fewer assets, more liabilities, and the owners would have to be kicking in to balance it. I know this all sounds like you know, algebra or something. It's not. Just remember it's got a balance. Remember 
It shows you kind of who owns it. And remember, ownership is worth similar to equity, right? <clears throat> and it's a snapshot. And that's what's going to be on the test. You know, one of the multiple choice questions will be, which statement, I, I'm feeling generous with my test questions. Now, not so much. After the cell phone rang. Uh, which, which balance sheet allows you to see the, a snapshot of a company's overall health? The other one you need to know, an income statement. Income statement is just dead easy. It's a period of time, and it looks, like, looks at what, what's come in, what's come out, and then you've all heard the phrase, the bottom line. That's an accounting phrase. When somebody says to you, just give me the bottom line, what are they saying? No, 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 don't read that. Just in, in, you know, when somebody walks up just, and you're telling them a story or whatever, they say, give me the bottom line. What do they want you to tell them? No. Sum it up. Sum it up. Thank you. Sum it up. That's what the income statement says, right? Made this, spent this. Here, bottom line, right? It's also known as a profit and loss statement. You know, and it's, it's the profit, hopefully, or loss of a company after the tax, and we're not going to worry about that. Just the bottom line. Clear? Yes? Uh, I, I thought the bottom line was the minimum amount of money you have to make in order to not uh, somehow On an accounting statement, on an income statement, the bottom line is what's left over of your profit after all of the expenses. Okay? Are you thinking maybe a bottoms up accounting? Are you, are you referencing this from one of my classes or just something you've had in the. In that was my understanding. Okay. Yes, your understanding is wrong. <laughs> um, so, some terms to know, and these show up on income statements. Revenue. Revenue, you've got it, you've got it. One thing that people screw up all the time is they, they mistake, they call income revenue or vice versa. They're very different, okay? Revenue is just money that's coming in. It's not profit, it's just money coming in. Now, it would be, our life would be easier if we just sort of classified that as income. <coughs> Don't. Revenue is the money that comes in, but it doesn't mean profit. This little abbreviation, acronym, whatever it is, can, can something be an acronym if it does, like MASH is an acronym, SCOOB is an acronym, but is AT&T an acronym? Like, does an acronym have to be pronounceable as a word? Are you sure? I'm not sure either. We'll have to figure that out at some point. Not now. Um, but so your cost of goods sold. And, and, and clarify this. And these, these are, I got to tell you, I know that this is probably your least favorite kind of lecture, but it's really important that you start thinking this way. Your cost of goods are whatever it costs you to make that thing you sell, right? If you're going to make a CD, your cost of goods, and I said CD specifically, would be actually making the, the you know, buying the containers and buying the CD and, and printing the artwork. Every time you sell one of those, it costs you something. One of the beautiful things about the digital world in which we live, you know, double-edged sword, it doesn't <coughs> cost us anything to make it MP3. Now there is cost of making the song, but that's not a cost of goods, right? Because that's a one-time thing. You go into the studio, you make it, it's a fixed cost, you eventually amortize it out. When you've got something that every time you sell it, you drink it at the sign, what's your cost of goods associated with that? Yeah, you do, come on. No, not, don't give me a price. What, what are the elements? What would, what, would, what, would have, what would you have to pay for to, to have, what would be accounted for as cost of goods with that? The bottle, right? the top, the water that goes inside of it. But would the would the um, would the marketing be a cost? Probably not. Probably not. What about the drilling of the well? If in fact they do that, they're probably just running that through some you know like a kitchen sieve or something. Right? It's clean. Um, that's not a cost of goods either. Right? It's the stuff that's really really attached to it. So then you keep moving down and you get to gross income. 
So your gross income is all the money you bring in minus what it costs you to make that thing, right? Still not profit, because here's where you get in some real costs. Marketing, research and development, all those things. So going back to the CD thing. So say we do a, say we make CDs for some, in it, let's do vinyl, because we like vinyl. Let's say we're gonna make vinyl, right? And it costs us a buck to make the jacket, right? The dust jacket. It costs us a buck to make, the, or 50 cents to make the thing, the, the actual LP, and, and another, for easy math, another 50 cents of shrink wrap. Our cost of goods on that vinyl piece is what? Two bucks. Now you've also got, well, let's just leave it at that. So you got two bucks. Now you're selling the boogers for 10 bucks a pop. Say you sell one. What's your gross income? Eight dollars. But, all right, let, let me change that. Say you, say you sell 1,000 of them. What's your gross income? $800. But say it costs you $200 to market it, $200 to record it, um, you know, whatever else. Those are your expenses. And then you subtract that $400, you get your net income. And your net income, your bottom line, is $400. You see how this works? It all just flows pretty easily. These are super expensive terms. Expensive? Important terms. You've got to get your head around what costs of goods are, and you've got to distinguish between revenue and income for the test and for your life. Just memorize. Any questions on this? Is it clear? It's not hard, but people screw it up, and I promise you it's going to be two or three questions on the test. Cash flow. How does the money come from the beginning to the end, right? This could be a week. I used to do it when I was running the label. I did it every day, because I wasn't sure I was gonna be able to make, you know, make payroll. How much came in today? Thank goodness it was more than what went out. That's all what cash flow is about, and it is the most important, and I think this may be a test question too. Of the three, cash flow is the most important element. Here's why. If you don't have positive cash flow, your balance sheet, your income, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be in business. So you've got to get cash flow. And this accounting period, as I say, it could be a month, it could be a year, it could be a quarter, it could be a day. Those are the only accounting statements I want you to know. So what you've got to know in terms of accounting, you've got to know your equation, right? You need to have some sense, some limited sense of what equity is. You've got to know a balance sheet an income statement and cash flow, and what differentiates the three of them. Remember, balance sheet, snapshot, moment in time. Income statement, profit and loss, and cash flow is just how the money sort of weaves its way, flows through the organization. Okay? Making great progress today. last substantive piece of information. This is the last thing that will show up on the test. Innovation. Save the best for last, right? Just like we talked about in entrepreneurship, successful people find ways to fix things. Successful business. They look for a problem, they try and fix it. We talked about the idea of entrepreneurship as being creative destruction. Got to tear something down and replace it with something creative. We like that. Right? And you do this, you win at business by more efficiently satisfying the customer's wants. Think about it. Think about the websites that you spend time on. Why do we all love Netflix streaming rather than Juiced? Because Juiced didn't satisfy my wants. It was first. They streamed long before Netflix did. And Hulu, they screwed it up. So someone came along and did it better. 
why do you all want to go to Bonnaroo more than you want to go to Jazz Fest? Because it satisfies your wants better, right? But the key word here is this efficiently word. If you got all the money and all the time in the world, you could do it, but we don't. You got scarce money, scarce resources. So you gotta be smart. And the way to do that is to innovate. And what happens when you innovate, this is the most important. You can affect the culture positively. You can do something in a way that, that people can kind of go, wow, that changed my life in a positive way. And if I haven't made it clear at this point that you should be thinking about how you can affect the culture positively in any venture you do, then boy, have I failed. Right? And the reason I like you to do it in a social entrepreneurship setting rather than necessarily in a not-for-profit setting is because you can make some money. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't do not-for-profits if that's what you're calling, but just know and you can, you can do very, very well. I got a good friend that runs um, a nonprofit drug clinic. Dude doesn't know what to do with all the money he's making, which is a sad commentary on our society. But he can't pay himself more than other drug facility treatments, even though he's much more successful than all those other people. Because the IRS will go, well, you're, you're not really running a not for profit. Not for profits can't have any profit, <laughs> right? Doesn't mean you can't pay yourself, doesn't mean you can't live very, very well. But you can't ever have the sort of explosive riches that you get in, in for profit. And it's such, you know, I'm biased towards sort of social entrepreneurship, but, uh, but that's not to say not for profits are bad. So, what does innovation do? It creates value. That's what you've got to do. Whether you're, you're working for yourself, whether you're working for a firm, if you don't bring something to the table, if you don't create value, you will be fired. If you build a business that does not create value, you will go out of business. If you make a record that does not create value in the minds of the listeners, your band will self-destruct. You've got to figure out how to create value. Some ways of doing this are taking old resources and shifting them around, right? Was Facebook new? Was Twitter new? Was Google new? No, it just shifted some resources around. Twitter's just an RSS, right? Oh, sorry, SMS, just an SMS message. And yet, dear Lord, that company's going crazy. Foursquare, is that new? Well, sort of, but they shifted the resources around. They took the resources that we got in terms of location on a cell phone and said, hey, let's use that resource to create a new business. When you do that, you can get one step ahead of your, of your competitors. I like innovation because it allows us to be creative, allows us to think, allows us to use those beautiful minds that we have and push them a little bit, right? And this is why, again, I say, and I said it early in the semester, you all, you creative types, you musicians, you people that have brains that gravitate towards the arts, you're the future. Creativity comes easy to you. And it gets easier because you, you're constantly sort of practicing it, right? You have no idea yet how rare a gift that is. A lot of people, those of you who have played, for instance, with uh, classically trained musicians, <coughs> who've done nothing but classical training, how's it go when you ask them to improvise? They can't do it. They haven't been trained that way. And it, it's the same in a lot, of, a lot of other sciences, right, where math and those types of things. Their job isn't to improvise. We don't want our accountants improvising. We don't want our surgeons improvising, right? You, you got to improvise. Creativity is thinking new, th new things. Innovation is doing them. And so an entrepreneur will kind of do both. They'll think up something cool, and then they'll do it. Please do it, right? And you take these ideas, and, and, and rather than them being ephemeral, just kind of blah, you shape them, right? You make them something you can hold, something you can feel, something you can hang on to, right? Purpose, right? Have a purpose. Have that thing. You say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this thing today. Do a series of small things. You, know, you don't have to do some grand gesture all the time. Just move the ball a little bit every day. 
It's constant, all right? This looks like a good test question. Which of the below is not true of innovation? A, it's a constant process. <laughs> um, most ideas don't work, right? So the more you try, the better chance you have of actually hitting on one that will work. Don't feel bad when one doesn't work. It's part of the thing, right? Feel good. Feel like, phew, I got that out of my system. Maybe the next one will work, right? We all know this. You people that write music, is everything you accepted that comes out of your mouth, you know, a masterpiece? Of course not. But if you don't have those things that aren't masterpieces coming out, your mouthpiece may never get nice. So the process is creativity, thinking of something cool, taking that cool idea, looking around in the marketplace and going, hey, who did this already? No one? Well, that's weird. Maybe my idea isn't so good. Or if somebody did do it, how can I do it a little bit differently? And then how do I actually get it into the marketplace? Don't stop here. And that's where most of you guys are. Not all of you, but most of you guys are really creative. You're thinking about new ways to do things, but you're not yet, and it's very understandable, not yet putting it into the marketplace. Find a way to. Find a way to get it out there. And I don't care if your marketplace is only seven people. Get it into the marketplace, because that will get you the feedback that you need. You don't have to write all these down. So some of the stuff that you're gonna, gonna kind of be walls to keep you from being creative, right? Searching for the right answer, quote unquote, right answer. Being so obsessed, oh, it's gotta be perfect. That ain't gonna work, right? You wanna throw logic out, frankly. We're living in a world right now where the old ideas, the logical ideas are really kind of stupid. Rules are stupid. Being practical is stupid. <laughs> thinking that play, thinking that fun, thinking that the things that you enjoy are frivolous is stupid. <laughs> Getting overly specialized in today's world is stupid. Not being comfortable with ambiguity, not being comfortable with the idea that, you know, I don't know, this may or may not work, that's stupid. Worrying about whether anybody cares if you look foolish is stupid. How else could I just by standing up here in front of you every day? Worrying about failure, we're all gonna fail, it's okay. You feeling uncreative is stupid, get creative. And you know you can. History, right? You think, you all, you've heard all your life. Make sure you pay attention to history or be doomed to repeat it, right? Yeah, maybe. But, you know, if that were true, we'd be making eight tracks, or CDs or whatever, or horse and buggies, you know, I mean, history, you can learn from history, you can learn a lot from Henry Ford, but, you know, the stuff that we gotta move on from, right? How things ought to be is really, that'll just crush your creativity, and you're gonna have lots of people telling you, ooh, that's not how things work. According to whom? You guys all have a very, I know this very well about you, you have a very, very healthy disrespect for authority. Yeah. Like Woody Allen and Annie Hall tearing up the traffic ticket. It's just that I just have a problem with authority. That was my Woody Allen. I'll never do that again. Uh, ways that you can enhance your creativity, right? Uh, this is problems, not PBS, the public broadcasting system. Although, you know, it is a challenge. Um, this is real important, right? You know, the iPhone works well for this, so does the mole skin. You know, just have something. These ideas tend to hit us at weird times, right? Right before you fall asleep. Why? Because you're finally letting your brain do that thing it wants to do. Create. Scribble. Satisfaction. It's written that way. Please do this. Don't get locked into looking at the same blogs, the same TV shows, the same magazines, the same people already. It's amazing. I watch freshmen come in and they glom together in their little cohort, and that's cool. And then, but then I see them four years later and they're with the same people, and that's cool, you're friends. But you know, at a certain point, you get this group think going on. Get out there. One of the great things about New Orleans is just the crazy-ass diversity this city represents. Never seen anything like it. 
Um, listening is good, right? Listen a lot. Listen a lot more than you talk. You don't need to do this yet. I do. You don't. You will. You don't yet. You think you do. You don't. <laughs> don't worry. I'll, I'll post these slides. I did post them already. I've already posted them. Why have you not printed them out and have them in front of you? All right. I should do that more often. Now you can take little notes, and that's what I'll do. That's a good idea, right? Not my idea. People have been doing that since the dawn of time. I've just decided not to do it. Maybe I'll change. Maybe I won't. I'm like that woman on Saturday Night Live. I'm kidding. No, I'm not. Did anybody see that? I don't watch Saturday Night Live very often. But that Bill Hader thing, did you see it on the news update? where he was the, the gay club promoter. That was the funniest thing I've seen in a long time. <laughs> the, the guy asking for a place to bring the Midwestern mom and dad. <laughs> you didn't see it, you should Google it. It's really fun. Um, this, yeah, you know, people centered in the respect that you wanna, you wanna sort of help solve their problems. It doesn't mean that you have to be an extrovert. I'm certainly not. Um, listen to customers, but not to a fault. Customers are not always right, right? And it is okay to fire customers, but gain information from them. Hmm? You can fire customers, believe me. You gotta fire some customers. We're about to do something with, with Day Trotter that's gonna piss people off, and you know what? I just don't care. It's not, you can't please everybody. You want, you guys know the 80 20 rule, right? You want your 20% of people, the really passionate people, to be excited. The rest of the people are largely worthless customers. Uh, culture of change, right? Balance. Focus. I want you guys to have high standards. I really, really, really do. I want you not to settle. I want you to, to think, yeah, I could do better, and then do it. You'll regret it if you don't. Some of you are going to regret it in this class. <laughs> I could have done better. Um, I'm not worried about you guys with this. You don't, you don't like no as a rule. Do find the thing you love. So this is how ideas sort of happen, right? You gotta be prepared. Songwriters know you gotta have the antenna up, as Bob Dylan said, right? He also says, lay, lady, lay. Um, you got to be willing to sort of investigate what, what that idea is, see if it has any worth. See if you can transform it, right? Take something and twist it a little bit. Then sit on it. Sleep on it. It's really true. You're going to have every impulse in the world to sort of just toss out an idea as soon as you get it. Sit on it just a little bit because you'll, you'll develop little nuances. I'm constantly writing proposals and marketing plans and stuff for people. I'll write it out. And my impulse is, wow, it's done, send it. And I force myself to stop and sleep on it. Because inevitably, there'll be something I'll want to do. After that sort of sitting on a period, you'll, you'll hopefully get a little bit of a illumination. Test it out. Talk to people. Do it in a beta test type thing. And then just kick its ass out to the world. Get it out there and be proud of it, whether it's a song or a shoe company or whatever. Get your ass on the line. Start waving the flag for what you believe in. Uh, don't worry about this. That. Successful business people find solutions to problems. You haven't talked about that. Talked about that. All right, talked about that. Good. All right, I got one more lecture for you. I'm done. You don't have to take notes on this. day we do things, we are things that have to do with peace. If we are aware of our life, our way of looking at things, we will know how to make peace right in the moment. We are alive. You got to be happy now. I know it's hard as somebody that's suffered through depression all my life. I know how hard it is. Keep fighting. Right? 
try to find a way to be happy. It's better. The problem is, is that this Western tradition of ours is when I do this thing, when I achieve this thing, when I graduate, when I get that car, when I get whatever, I'll be happy. Be happy now. One of my closest friends a few months ago, the film editor for Errol Morris, who's probably the happiest person I know, was walking out of a CVS in New York City and some jackass was fleeing the police in his car and pinned her against another car and killed her. Thank people for what they do. Right? Thank you. Thank you all. I've enjoyed this. Thank people. Let stuff go. Don't hang on to stuff that's not doing anything for you. You can't do anything about it, so let it go. Because we all do bad shit. We all do stuff that we regret. We all do stuff that we don't want in our lives anymore. And there's no good in having it stick around with you, right? It's done. It's over. I don't mean that to say that what you do doesn't matter. It does. It's only what you do now that matters. People tend to think that we're some sort of accumulation of things, right? That's an illusion. It's a lot. All we are is what we do right now. So at any moment, you can reinvent. You can become that person. All we have is our behaviors. Right? I don't know many of you that well. But you could walk into me in my office or up on the street, and you could either bond with me, impress me, piss me off, make me laugh. That's all that's going to matter in that moment. It's your behavior. It's not your family. It's not any of the other things. What are you going to do when you leave this class? Right now. That's what matters. Nothing else really matters. You're here now. You can't do anything about that. What are you going to do next? That's what will define you. And in business and in Buddhism, the self becomes the obstacle. The ego becomes the obstacle. You all laughed when I said I bow to your inner Buddha as all the late people walked in. I wasn't kidding. I do. I respect you. And I gotta let go of myself, and you guys gotta let go of yourself. And focus on your actions and doing things not because of some sort of internal ego thing, right? Habits, doctrines, smugness, memories of the past, they do no you no good. They do you no good. They will get in the way, they will cause you fear. They will make you not do the things that you should do, and they will make you do the things that you shouldn't do. Your ego. Get rid of it. The most unhappy people you will ever meet are the ones with the biggest egos. Okay? Just as I was saying about innovation, if you worry too much about the past rather than being in the moment and looking at your surroundings right now, you will fail, right? Each moment is a new moment with new opportunities that will erase all of that stuff. You may have something that you're embarrassed about in your life. You may have some failure in your past that you're carrying around with you for no good reason. The quickest way to get rid of that is to do something good. It's the only way to erase it. What do you see in front of you? Not behind you. Right? And most people are constantly looking, they're trying to get approval from mom and dad, from people that are dead, right? People trying to impress their dead granddad. You know? What's in front of you? <coughs> Don't carry this stuff around. All the therapy, all this stuff in the world, get what you need, but realize that it is far easier to get unfucked up by just not being <coughs> fucked up than it is to figure out why you're fucked up. Just stop being fucked up, right? <laughs> Do good work. It's 
not fair. It's totally not fair. My friend was pinned to a car and killed. Walk around the street, look at people that were born with terrible things to overcome. You know, life isn't fair. Don't find yourself being that person, that woe is me person. All of you are blessed. Declare victory, move on. Keep moving. Life is good. You're done. Good luck. I'll see you Wednesday.